All right. So welcome everybody. Thanks a lot for coming, even on it's a rainy day, and it's funny because it's the second time I gave a talk on the Unicode, code, and again it's raining. <laughs> I'm somewhat a rainmaker, but um, thank you for coming, even though it's raining. And today I'm gonna talk about lazy loading JavaScript modules. And on the first session we had two months ago, I introduced this module subject when I was talking about time patterns. So I want to know: is there anyone here that was on the first session? Oh, hi. So, um, for those that were not here, I can provide the links to that because I'm going to give a refresher anyways about modules, but there is more information about modules and even other design patterns that you guys can check it out. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to give a challenge and you guys are free to try out some drive together. And if you guys don't have time to finish it off today, you guys can send in your, your interest in trying to finish it up. You can talk to me. I'm going to give my company information to help. Also, like, if you're interested in trying out the challenges from the first session, you are more than welcome to try it out, and I will be more than happy to assist you. Okay? And this, uh, the first session, we had, like, two breaks. So we had some time pattern, and then we had a coding break, and we had another session, and another break. This, we're going to have this one session of talk, and then one break. But there was, yeah. Third session we wanted to do it last time we didn't have time to, and if we have time today we may also do it together up to. If, if, if not, I can just mention and you guys can try it out on your own. Alright? Cool. So, lazy loading ES 2015 modules in the browser. Let me enter full screen. So, just a minute about me. That's me and my wife on the Golden Gate Park roller blading. <laughs> Bless you. So I would just say I'm a JavaScript PI, I'm Doc Daddy, Return Roller Blade, and not a typical Brazilian. As you can see, I have accent. <laughs> um, I am a tech manager at Avenue Code. I'm a tech lead here at Macy's, so I work with Christine on a daily basis. <laughs> That's my Twitter. If you guys would like to follow me, I'm going to post those slides, and if you guys have any questions or any follow-ups, I would be more than help, happy to con connect with you guys and take it from there. I also have a site where I put my other talks and articles that I have gave. And this is my email, too. You guys are free to reach me out, okay? I also posted the link for this talk on the meetup.com uh, chat. So you can take from there, and you can feel free to browse those slides on your own while I'm using them out here. It's gonna come back and stuff, okay? And this is about Avenue Code. So Holly already mentioned we have um, compositions. We have offices in Brazil, so it's this all started in Brazil. I was working in Brazil a few years ago before I moved here. So I have offices in San Francisco, São Paulo, and Belo Horizonte. We do different practices like project management, business analysis, DevOps, FQA, coaching, and Agile and stuff. And if you are interested about the careers, this is our link, but you can also come and talk to Brittany. Alright, so let's get to the agenda. We're going to have two parts today. Part one is going to be a little more theoretical. So I'm going to explain about lazy loading, JavaScript lazy loading, why should I do it? Should I not do it? And the part two, blazing loading, we're going to go about hands on. So, how to do lazy loading in AMD modules, CommonJS modules, ES 2015 modules, and SystemJS, how we're going to use that to lazy load anything. We have some prerequisites, like we hope you are a little familiar with JavaScript because I'm going to be. I'm not going to talk about JavaScript on part one, but on part two, uh, we're going to be showing some code. But I can try to assist in questions that you guys may have. Okay. So part one, it's not every day you're asked to get lazy, and that was such a strong word here this <laughs> this year. And it fits well in the winter, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I would like to take some steps back to where this all started from. 
So back in the day, we had a program of this thing called HTML5, where all the apps, they you now can be developed in the client side, and they can behave like a real app, because they are stored, faster, and smoother, and things better and stuff. So many companies started to move their server side apps to the client side, especially for mobile devices. And on the premises of game on performance. But, I mean, there are a lot of great benefits with that because the requests that would for instance for HTML, in, like for instance, take a Ruby on Rails application back in the server time, so the request is in HTML, every request in the page and stuff. Now the request can render in the and it can be rendered them on the client side. And JSON. Uh, messages are even much smaller than HTML messages, so you're probably going to get a lot less, uh, uh, a lot smaller messages. And rendering a new view instead of a page reload is also a big thing because you don't need to wait for the full round cycle time to the server and getting processed by the HTTP server and headers and stuff. You just render some view on the client side in the snap. One more thing that was a boom was to route on the client side. So you can even the browser can take you to another route without going back to the server just by using state management and routing on the client side. So all of those things are great and very important. But that may not be enough for performance. So depending on the way we load our JavaScript, we could be, you know going on the opposite direction. So have, we, have you ever considered, you know, if your application is downloading more stuff that is actually being used? And that's the thing that I like to call out for you to think every time you develop code in any language, if you really are using the code that you are loading yourself. That's where this all started. Because those performance games, they can fall short. If you are downloading everything in one shot, but just using like 10% of your time, because you are downloading heavy messages and you are making the user to wait longer. So I would like to show you an example. Uh, there are, let's suppose there are two sites, site A and site B, and how would they differ depending on the rendering that we're going to have. So far, are you guys with me? Good. Yeah? SPA, it's a single page application, sorry. It's a, an application that is entirely meant on the client side, so all of these things would be part of the single page application, like running a review and, and browsing and stuff. But sorry, it's gonna give you that, that explanation. Yeah, it, it should read much nicer, like spa. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. Getting lazy, going to spa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, lazy loading 101, true example. So, let's suppose I have an e commerce A, which is server side rendering. And in that case, that side has five pages. And this is the path to purchase. So, you open the site, you land on the home page, and then you click on some categories, you get browse page. And then you select a product. You see the product page. From that page, you add to your cart. So you can you are taken to the cart page, and from the cart page, you can check out. So this is like Macy's or Amazon or Gap, right? So let's think about this scenario. Five pages the user has to follow to purchase. So in a server-side rendered site, hypothetically, let's say each page downloads 300k of HTML and 100k of JavaScript. So that makes 400k of download every page. So the complete flow will download 400k on each page and 2 megabytes total. So after, after the user has visited all the pages, he downloaded 2 megabytes. 400 at a time. Okay? Um, now la let's compare that to the second e commerce. So let's suppose we have a single page application that has the same five pages. However, because it is a single page application, just the first page is an actual service type round page. Because the four follow the next four following pages they are later on the client side. So the server was, has brought the home page, but then from home page to browse and from browse to browse to browse.
start it together. You can back it out. It all happens in the time. Okay? In that case, home page would still have no same stuff, 300k of HTML and 100k of JavaScript. So the first round trips is still 500k. But each one of the following views has just 50k of JSON and 50, uh, 100k of JavaScript. So it's just 200, it's half, right? So theoretically, we will have much less things to download with this architecture. So the complete flow would download 1.2 megabytes versus two before. Right? So we have 400, 200, 200, and 200, so that makes 1.2 megabytes. So that's a very good thing. However, if you download everything in one shot, you got 80% of those 1.2 megabytes on the home page. So now we have a home page that downloads 1 megabyte versus 4 it is only 500 megabytes. So now you have a more than twice a, you know, heavier page. And the home page is only the most important page, so it's just well, oh, it's just loading and static. No, so you can give up. So this is really something that we should consider. Maybe we should not load everything in one shot. Maybe we should load the thing as we go. And that is why we are talking about regular. So that's why we care about regular. That's gonna come and say, okay, we're gonna just load the homepage stuff on the homepage. And then whenever you go to browse, then you load the browse stuff. And then you go to product, then you go to load the product stuff. Okay? So that's the idea behind regular. And if you if we use lazy loading in this scenario, right, we will have 400k on the, on the home page and 200k each view after. That's where I want to take us today. Any question about this so far? About the idea? Okay. Excellent. So what is lazy loading? So now that you guys have the idea about lazy loading, let's get more nerdy. <laughs> So lazy loading is a design pattern about deferring the initialization of the resource until the point at which it's needed. And that's not a new idea. It's been there for probably 20 years. This is a concept that started on the data base. So when we're talking about data, also it's very frequent that you don't need all the data in one shot. So let's talk about you know, the product data. So there is a page, so the first page in the phone is about the product. That page you want to see all of the information about the product. But when you are just seeing a banner or an ad, no, just like a suggestion of the product, you probably are only seeing the title, the image, the price, that's it. You don't have like space to show all the different colors and all the different stuff. So you don't need to load all the data, all the product data, just to render the ad, you know? So, that's another use case of lazy loading. You could only load the, those five first fields of product data when we are showing the ad. And then whenever the user clicks on that ad and opens the full page, then you load the rest. So this is, again, lazy loading. There, we are referring the loading of data until the point we need. We could also be talking about requests. So, Let's say you are in a product page, so this is something that you can see at Macy's or at Amazon. There are reviews, but the user needs to scroll down to see the review. So we, if you like to load the review, it means that whenever you load the page, the reviews are not loaded yet. After the user starts to scroll down the page because he wants to see the review, then we make the call to fetch the reviews and render in why the call is happening, you're seeing, you know, that similar. So this is because we are lazy loading stuff. And because we are lazy loading, we are not doing that call on the table. So we are page loads faster. Okay? It could also be used back to the database part or program time when we are allocating memory. So if you have you know, just 10 megabytes of memory, you, can, you should think about, okay, let me fit only the data that I need first on this those 10 megabytes, and after I need it, then I need the rest. Every time you have limited resources, like data space or network, so our focus on that is more about network, then we can consider lazy loading. 
So the main goal of lazy loading is to improve efficiency when a significant amount of resources is not needed at first. And lazy loading is targeted to increase the performance and save on memory consumption and processing power. It is a EAA pattern. So there is this guy is one of the gurus of pattern format and power. I think he works for power. And he created a book called EAA pattern, like enterprise application something. <laughs> Architecture. <laughs> and this is a, one of the most referred books about pattern. And they talk, so I put a link here. This book is from 94, I guess, like 20 years ago, and they have this pattern, lazy load. So that's why we have this going on for a long time. But before, the interesting part, so why are we talking about lazy loading in JavaScript? Because um, back in the day, you know, JavaScript was mostly needed to do some jQuery stuff to render some UI like component or make some call, but now we are having a full application coding in JavaScript. So now, you know, we have a lot of complex logic going on and lots of modules and types to render to represent that logic. So that's why now it makes sense to talk about lazy loading in JavaScript, much more than ever. And I want to explain you guys about a concept that defines like, why do we need to lazy load? At least we use that here at Macy's. It's called the fold. So think about a newspaper. So when you go to the newsstand and you see all the newspaper, they come folded. And the part which is above the fold is the most important part. So that part, the job, the main job of the part is to convince you that it is an interesting issue. And then if you are attracted to that, then you want to come forward and do the rest. So the part that goes above the fold is what comes to convince it about the value of the list. So we can take the same concept here to the right. So the fold is the bar that you see on the bottom of the screen. So every single render above the fold is very critical and needs to be rendered first and needs to be delivered first. Because that's the part that the user are gonna see first. And then if the user are into your site, then they're gonna scroll down into the rest. Okay, so we typically consider that content above the fold is as critical as possible, and we, it's normally not a very good idea to raise the load the fold. But everything that is below the fold is a very good candidate for the void because it requires some user interaction. And even the browser makes some decisions for you. So there is something called critical rendering time. And the browser, so let's say you have a page full of images. And let's suppose if you're not doing any lazy loading, you're basically doing an HTML with 20 images. But you can only see three images above the page. Even the browser will prioritize those three images to be downloaded before the other 17. Because the browser knows, okay, those are the really important ones, you need to get those right. So those resources, they are prioritized by the browser, and there is something called critical image pass. That is how that magic happens. So this is the path of the browser and those things, they must be rendered during the page load time, no matter what. So this, it can't, I mean, it can, but normally not a good idea to lazy load. Then we have below the fold. Below the fold is everything else. It needs scrolling or user interaction. So not only scrolling, but let's say there's something that needs to click. So let's say there is the zoomer on the image that we want to see in the large image that requires a click. So that's all. So that big image can be lazy loaded. You lazy load the big image for it because you know even if the user never clicks on the zoomer, you do have that image downloaded anyway. So if you lazy load like the zoomer, you don't download the big image. Only after the user clicks on the zoomer to see the large image. Then we download the large thing. In that case, users that never interact with the zoomer will never have to download to spend one megabyte of the data to download that thing. Okay? So those are typically things that won't be displayed during the page load time. And thus they don't need to be rendered 
with the page load. Thus, it can be lazy loaded. And I'd like to show you a quick example. Mm. So I'm gonna go to Macy's. So this is our poll. So we have the information, colors and stuff. I have a bunch of colors. But if we collect the colors, you see those are the really important things. The buttons, the add to the left, add to the list, add to the right. See your colors, see your price, see the promotion, see the image, see the output images, and see even some recommendations. So those things are really critical, but I, I'm going to scroll down and if the network is slow, you're going to see there is a loader while we load the reviews. I'm going to click here on the reviews and it was there for half a second. I don't know if it was there. <laughs> but then we got the reviews here. But those reviews were not there when we loaded the page. And this concept, you know, is being used by pretty much any e commerce. So if, let's go to Amazon. Amazon, we can see easily I think so let's see this fire so I'm gonna scroll down then things start popping up normally not this one oh yeah the reviews they did a very quick spinning process yeah I guess this network is pretty fast <laughs> but yeah Normally it's the opposite. Normally I always want the internet to be faster. Now I want it to be slower. <laughs> but uh, I, I guess you got the idea. So that's where it's important. It makes sense to do lazy loading. Okay? So far so good? Beautiful. So if you are considering lazy loading, it's a matter of content prioritization. And content prioritization may be something that your product manager wants, no matter what, wants the reviews to be there, and there may be nothing to do, but maybe you can do some influence, right? So, you, when you see the code, you can ask yourself, is there any chunk of code or library that only runs below the fold, like the reviews panel, or that only runs after some event, like a button click, or upon a certain condition, like some free shipping widget that only shows up for the free shipping products. Those are things that could potentially be lazy loaded easily. They are easier to identify. So then, if you answer yes, you may profit from lazy loading and potentially improve your page performance. Then, you would just defer the downloading of those chunks of code libraries until a trigger is executed. So if you're scrolling down, you can have a trigger like an event listener that listens for the scroll, or if it's like a button click, it's the click listener of the button, or if it's an uncommon widget, it's like the condition, if some condition, then it's based on the stuff. That's how we typically do it. And lazy loading isn't recommended for certain scenarios. So if, especially if you're doing for mobile devices, if you want to support network limitations, like offline mode, then you probably should be doing lots of lazy mode. But let's say you have like a, a mobile site that behaves like an app. And the user wants to purchase, but you know, you're just getting to the point, you're going to, you're on the bar, you're going to open, and then all of a sudden you don't have network, but you still want to talk. So at least the next phase is with the lazy mode, the user will be blocked. Right there. So this is something to consider. Also, web mobile apps, which are web, were enclosed in web views. So an example is Apache Cordova. It is a technology where you can create like a HTML type and you create an iOS app with the inside. Normally, when we do this, we do want the app to behave like an app, even though it's a website behind the scenes. So in that case, you know, apps, they are, Downloading at once. The data can be lazy loaded, but the module probably not a good idea to lazy loading if you want them to behave like an app. 
apps that can be paused like games, and specific UX requirements. So one example, you guys use Slack? Mm -hmm. So have you ever used Slack on the browser? If you open in a browser, you know it takes forever to load. <laughs> That's a UX requirement. I came to a talk and one engineer at Slack told me that one of their first UX said, okay, we would rather the user to wait a long time at first and have the app already in very interactive for later instead of just loading things in front. So that was the thing they made. That's why we have to wait a long time. But after the load, it's pretty in a good. Also, American Eagle, they have a requirement. They don't like loaders. They don't want the thing with it. <laughs> <laughs> so then, they don't like load. You know, so they don't want the load. So that if your UX really wants that, then it's a requirement. So it's not a bullet like a silver bullet, but small things we can always do, typically. Um, so far so good? Nice. So let's see how to lazy load. Yeah? Uh, good question, Christian. So, no. We could use, um, for instance, animation on the desktop side to try to convert the application. We do that for getting better page load time performance results. So this is one of the things we do in the space. We try to label all the third parties. So we have third parties that put in the bottom so that we have to reuse them. We come from the device, we have uh, user generated users from all the have two fields and stuff. So all of those third parties we are going to so it takes like a couple clicks to reach them. So it could be helpful in any end. You know, I'm focusing today on e-commerce, so that's mostly my experience, but I, I'm pretty sure, you know, other areas would be able to benefit from that. I guess in some way. But um, I think anything that's very data has has on data can do a lot of data. Thank you. Okay, so how to lazy load. First, don't include everything at once. So that's how we got the page when we started to work. There were a lot of script tags in the header, you know, in the head of the body, on the, on, in the head of the HTML page, in the HTML page, and we do not want to load everything in the head if we are not using it. So we, we remove the stuff that was not getting used first, and then we start a little on it. Also, do not import your modules on the top of your file, all of them. Just import the ones that are required for the initial load and things that can be lazy loaded that could be required inside your callbacks. I'm going to show an example to make the idea more clear, but that's pretty much the case. Just instead of importing everything, importing all your modules on the top, just import them as you need them. Then you would carefully decide when to import or require your modules. Like, I think I mentioned that before. So below the folder, you could put inside a scroll listener, event callbacks for user interactions or network calls, you can require on a callback, conditionally for uncommon scenarios, and timeouts. You guys all have seen the chat overlay the pop up after 10, 10 seconds. So you could set a timeout, and after 10 seconds, when it's time for you to see the chat overlay, then you load the module. So even that module doesn't have to be loaded on the page. So the talk is about JavaScript, but you can also lazy load images, fonts, and CSS. And if you use Webpack, Webpack can be that way. You can lazy load data, you can lazy load everything. You can lazy load yourself. You can go to the <laughs> spa. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to the part two, OK? So we're going to see some of those things like just five seconds. <laughs> mm. Okay, so any question right now? Okay, I'm going to show you guys three strategies for modules AMD, Common JS, and ES 2016. This is probably about 2016, so or ES 6. I will focus more on that part, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna so with not as much detail as you have to see other models, but if you guys have more questions, then I'll come in at me later, okay? So let's just start talking about AMD or Required JS. So how many people here have used or are aware or familiar with Required JS or AMD? Okay. All right. No problems. And AMD was something big like five years ago or four years ago. Now it's no longer the hot thing in the market, but still heavily used for me to use it a lot. Because it uses it's a very good framework. But AMD, like AMD is like a format of the module in required JS implementation, the most common implementation for AMD. It is very good, but it's asynchronous. So it's asynchronous module definition. And because it is asynchronous, it is harder to manage. Because if you have a dependency that has another dependency and stuff, they all result in on one time. So it is possible to get yourself into a simulation with if you are programming everything that's internet. So I'm gonna show you next common JS, which is the one that no JS uses where everything is synchronous and it's much easier to handle your model. So you're not likely to run into the Promises? Yeah, we we can make promises to do that. So promises is one of the solutions to for the model. But uh race conditions they could happen to have, if I were, let's say, five modules at the same time. So that could even happen with promises. If you are loading like five modules at the same time, and they share some data, you cannot guarantee which one is going to load first, if they are asynchronous. So if you know the module two has a dependency that waits for something to happen from module one, and you don't do any treatment, you can never guarantee. So if module one comes before module two, then you're good. But if module two comes from module one, then something fails. Then you can use promises to wait until module one is loaded, then load module two and stuff. So we, we, those things can be done, but it's a little tricky, but we can totally do it. But it's just, because it's not very intuitive, many, it's easy for it to, by accident, create a bug because, oh, there's a dependency and I did remember. So it's kind of hard. Uh, that was the problem with AMD. So, so many companies started using AMD, and many companies gave up and came back to synchronous just because they couldn't handle that including stuff like that. But I'm, I'm going to show you there, which is based on promises. And I'm going to show you how we can use promises to um, sync the loading of the model. But I, I would like to give you guys a small refresher on AMD. So, Going to the code, let's suppose we have a model called DOM. So this is the form for AMD. We have a defined function where we can pass a list for the model. So here we're registering a model called DOM. So there's a file dot JS. We create this model DOM, so we need a name. These are arrays for dependency, we don't have any dependency. So, and we pass a function. So we have some code, and we return Something. So my module, whenever someone requires that, we're going to return something. So what is that? It is a function. So this is like a prototype object creation through a constructor here that we see his name and date. We assign the name that came from the parameter to this dot name, and we do the same thing with grid. So when people do new dot and have like two parameters, the first one is one, second is and DOM has a method called bar assigned to the prototype. The really prototype. This is like one of the headers that I spent on my prototype. I'll just use the constructor and use the prototype. So I can give you links to those bytes as well. But this is pretty much recreating a function that is declared once, but if you have 100 DOMs, they all are going to share the same definition of the function bar. And the function bar pretty much so we return the name of the doc and the virus file. But that virus file is another function. This function is private to the model, so it's not accessible from so bar called it, but XR users can call the function. And it's gonna check the grid. If the grid is custom, it's gonna do more like a wall, otherwise a regular 
And this is my a typical model, so you could do any other kind of model, but I I, I like to focus much more on this part but on this part here. So you'll see sometimes it's a good turn here. So that's your model. Okay. So given that we have the dog module, how to laser load the dog module? Upon user interaction. So let's now create a name. So name is like another module that's going to consume dog and the name of dog. So let's see what we have a page. It has a button called load dog button. So here we are document that anybody can see that button. Then you have a click button. So that's the callback of the click button. So before you click on the button, nothing happens. Once the user has clicked on the button, the comment is called. And then what do we do? We require the DOM. And that's the same area that I gave before. So when this happens, then the browser is going to go and download the DOM from the next. And whenever it's finished downloading, this comment comes from the next And then I'm going to have the DOM right here. And now we can use the DOM. So here we just get some container, we instantiate the dog, so that's my dog, so I'll put this in there. And I said I'll put it in there. I will, I'll, I'll <laughs> pick her in. Um, so, yeah, I should raise a little bit, dog. So, <laughs> and I append the bark to the dog. So this is what happens. Here I'm waiting for the user V1. To the button, the dog, the button, once they load it, they so have to put it on the button. I will show the same example as I'm going to name to you, on the S, on the S, 6, and I'm going to show you the drawing, this happening, but right now, um, I don't have a list. I would like to speak, not show you the drawing and this, but showing just the lesson, but you guys, have the idea of what we So we're going to see it live on the last one. Okay? This was just more for comparison. So, AMD is asynchronous. You could notice that the dog is resolved dynamically. So, if you had another module, or if the dog, you know, depending on another module called like Zoo, for instance, or a cage, let's say dog is a cage. So, <laughs> Here, okay, dog needs food. <laughs> so you could pass some dependencies here and then come here and do that. So that means that whenever you load dog, you also load food. And not so hard as it can happen. Okay? So that was AMD. Um, I'd like to go to CommonJS. Do you have any questions about this? Okay. So CommonJS, a quick refresher. CommonJS is simpler to understand. It's the model that we all learned when we do the So it is similar. So this is a file about the same structure, the same document, but it's more than that it's So every time someone wants to require a dog, they get module exports. So here is the question. How can we do lazy loading with CommonJS? First is we can. I mean not natively because CommonJS doesn't support it. So I'm gonna ask my little friend Webpack to help me out. So Webpack has something called required that ensure that we require the required from the the same thing as the same body input is going to be required on shirt. And test this function as has to be required. You can require dog in the comedy as well. And here you can use the dog. And the beautiful thing about that time is that that can figure out that oh, and okay, you need some really old here. So when that's not going to put that in your model. You're going to leave that to the model model. That's not going to be delivered together as a we're going to talk about bugging, but 
Think about where can we do the hard work for this central discourse to be going centrally and centrally. So this all happens behind the scenes in the United States Okay. And I'm so happy to learn this table video, which is system bands. So I put a link here if you want to read more about that. It's called code splitting. It's a feature of Red Hat. And for those that are not very familiar with Red Hat, Red Hat is like a bundle of code. So it's a tool that you can add to your pipeline, to your process. To process your modules, so Webpack can do a lot of things. It can deliver modules that can combine, it can create bundles, bundles for CSS, JavaScript, images, and stuff. And you can use Webpack to manage your entry points that will load these bundles altogether. And when we say bundles, it means we are combining files in one file. So let's say you have 20 things required in line. Have an app, let's say you have jQuery, you have a score, you have, no, I don't know, backbone or something else, handlebar. All of those things to be combined and delivered in one shot to you by Webpack. And then if you have dog that requires food and food requires plants and plants require water and so forth, all of those want to be part of the bundle that gets manipulated only after the delivery to So this is what I mean when I talk about bundles. And Webpack does a very good job to manage the bundle part. Okay? So let's go to the funny one. ES 2015. And you know, you may have heard ES6, ES 2015, ES Next, ES 2015, ES 2017, ES 10, ES, ES 8, and I don't know how to pronounce this anymore. But what does it mean? ES ECMAScript. That's the official name of JavaScript. And the one that everybody has run is ES5. Um, so, like a, four or five years ago, the community came up, okay, we need to have a new version of JavaScript. And they started to call it ES6 because the current version was five, right? But after some discussion, they decided that ES6 was way too bigger and too broader in scope. They decided to break the releases down per year. So instead of saying, no, now it's ES6, ES7, ES6, no. We're going to have ES 2015, which is everything we've got settled to implement in the browser. So a subset of ES6 called ES 2015 was the group that was selected to be implemented by the browser. So right now, Chrome and WebKit, they are close to 100%. Of natively support ES And that's the goal. So once we get other dollars supported ES 2015, then like next year we get the dollars to work in the future that are in US ES twenty sixteen and so on. And before we have all the support we want, or if we want to support the old dollars, we have to use some tools to do the transpilation. A transpiler so probably you have heard about Babel or cursor, those are systems that you can form, you can code in AS 2015, they can form it to the S5 code for you. So you don't have to worry with that, you can code in the new language, in the new version, and don't, and not worry with who is going to run it. And whenever all the browsers are supporting readably, you can just remove battle and run that code natively. So that's Something that's, that has been has been very much adopted by the industry the past two years. So that's why I'm mentioning here because I think it's very relevant. So any new uh, development you guys may do in your project, if you have access to ES 2015 and beyond, that is something that we always recommend for you to learn and try out because more and more are going to see new systems, new, new projects using this thing. Okay. So a quick refresher and there's a bunch of new stuff. Here. So instead of var I'm using let, let's say I'm going to look at a var. A var has probably its code, so if you have a var inside of me, then I will use some kind of a list. But if you do let, let's only use this code. So it's recommended. 
here it doesn't make any difference. There is the bar, but if you have the left inside of it, that bar is only in the end of that table. So we have the left here. The rest is the same. We have class, so we have function dog. Instead of expressing that way, we can use something called class that is pretty much the same. It's like a syntax server. It's easier to read. So we have a constructor that receives the same thing in read, assigns to read, and we are defining a function, a method called bar from the prototype. So instead of doing dog and prototype of bar, you don't need the word function, you can just say bar. And then you return something. And here you're there is something called string um, interpolation, which if you use the matrix, you can function um, the variable inside the string. So this domain and that works how we already consume inside the string. So we have this it's the same thing that we have before in the US without using problems and we can export. So pretty much like more exports. You can just say we export, then we are exporting this document. And that's the model. Okay? So that's the model that we implement in the version of JavaScript. Now let's consume this guy. So let's suppose you have, um, okay, the further. How can we lazy load stuff in the SR15? So there was a proposal for a module loader, but it didn't make it. So yes, SR15 doesn't ship with module loader specification. There was a very nice proposal called ES6 module loader. It has been retreated because the community didn't agree on how to do it and stuff. <coughs> but it was a very nice proposal. It used promises behind the scenes. And some of the developers decided to develop a tool called 16.js that's pretty similar to that step. It all uses promises. So off that, now there is a new proposal called Loader. It's in the works. It, it was meant to be delivered with ES 2016. But I think yes, 2016 is not shipping with border, but you can use the system and replace that later. It's still in development, so there's the same working progress of that. So let's see about the system before we learn how to do lazy loading. So system.js is a module loader which supports all the forms, AMD, CommonJS, ES15, and even global scripts. It performs asynchronous module loading using a promises-based API. Um, if you guys want to know more about promises, is basically when you ask, so when you go to some takeout restaurant, and you pay for a deal, and then you do this uh, thing that you did whenever your order is ready. So that's a, that's a promise. You can think of that as a promise, because it's something that it takes, you and do your stuff, and whenever your food is ready, ah, it's gonna resolve, it's gonna beep, and then you know that you can go and fetch your food. So, this is like the same idea of promises. Promises is like an object that a function returns. You don't scan the function, the object, that the function will work, and whenever you know the call is ready or whatever happens, the promises will resolve, and then you know, okay, now it's time to, to use that. So, it's an alternative to callbacks because going back to the MD, everything will be in callbacks. And if you have a callback that depends on another callback that depends on another callback, then all of a sudden you can have something that is called callback hell. You see a lot of callbacks one inside the other, and it's pretty hard to synchronize them all. So if you need to wait for callback one, then callback two, and callback three, the three of them to finish, you need to make some lots of conditions to check if. Uh, call back one and two and three is done, do that, else do that. So, you know, it's very complex. But if you do promises, you can just receive the promises for call one, call two, and call two, and call three, and wait for them. And whenever all of them are ready, then you do your stuff. So, we say the promise will be resolved or a promise will be rejected. And it's easy to ask you to use promises. So, promises is something that was uh, also not part of the 
file for the reason that you know, it is not there is a new concept. But even before that, there are some libraries that it comes with, like Bluebird or BigQuery BigQuery. And it's pretty much the same idea. So system.js uses promises, and promises can be chained and combined easily. And you can use something called promises.all. So if you have to wait on like five modules to load, you can just give all the promises to promises.all, and whenever all of them have been called, resolved, then you can call your callbacks and stuff. So I'm going to show you an example of how to say that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, great question. I'm going to show you. Um, I don't have that in my example, but with any promise, you can call, you can decide what you want to do. You can call then, you can call, you know, a callback if the promise is resolved or not. So if one of them fails, you can set to fail all of them. So you can decide if you want to try it again. You can just code that in your callback. But you can take an action. So if one of them fails, promises are all, it's not going to fire success. It's going to fire like error. But you can also, there's another function called then or done that fires anyway. You can reattempt there if you want. I mean, you can just call whatever reaction you want. You can consider, no, it didn't work. So just for you to know, require JS if one of the the dependencies doesn't resolve, it still returns, but the guy is undefined. So that uh, that was the case. Um, unless you can make it strict, you can define no. If one of them fails, I want the entire thing to fail, which makes more sense in some cases. But you really can define how you wanna that to be um, reactive. So here I'm going to show how to use system.import and get a promise. So the same way we did before, I had to put a place in here, and we had a bucket here. So now I'm using something from that is called arrow function. It's the same thing as final function, but instead of writing function, I'm writing now, and it gives the argument. It has some different things like this, the context, but they're not the argument here. And here, I'm doing system dot import dot dot with again the alias or the file of my body. And this is a prompt. This returns me a prompt. I call dot then. So whenever the prompt is resolved, I'm going to call this callback that's going to take dot, another callback, and do that. So if I have, here, if I have like three modules, then is of everything. But if I only want that to And we're going to show that live. Okay, let me show that live before I continue. Oh, yeah. So, I have a two example projects in my GitHub. Let's take a look if you want. So in this case, I have something called Zoo. You know what? Let me show you the source code. So this is a project. There is a module called Zoo, which Similar to my dog module, but it also has wolf. Okay, so this is a module zoo, and there is another module called cat. I have cat and zoo, and I have main. In my main JS, um, cat is being imported synchronously. 
using import. In that case, cat is going to be part of the same bundle as main. But inside the click listener of load zoo, we are doing system.import. And whenever this guy is loaded, then we call, we use zoo. So zoo is being lazy loaded. And I'm using Webpack. So Webpack created for me two bundles. The main bundle has the code of main and the code of cat, but not zoo. Zoo is lazy loaded on another bundle. And Webpack is very cool because can you see here on the left side there are two files main bundle, it has everything, and one dot bundle. So it's going to create one dot bundle, two dot bundle, and so forth. So here, if I go to sources, Um, content scripts, snippets, okay, sources. We have like main bundle here. So let me refresh the page. This page is loading main bundle. It has 6k. Only after I click on zoo, then this bundle was called one dot bundle, which has less than a k. <laughs> Not very meaningful, but just to illustrate, we saved that byte and we lazy loaded zoo. So now zoo, which is part of one dot bundle, um, came after I click, and you can click any so many times more. It's not gonna load it again because the browser knows it's being loaded once already. Um, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Good question. So if cat depends on food, then it would have been part of the main bundle. And then whenever you load zoo, because you had already loaded food in the main bundle, it wouldn't be part of the zoo bundle. So Webpack does that for you. Webpack resolves all your dependencies. And he knows, okay. So if both dog and cat depend on zoo no, and food but food is already provided be because the cat was loaded first so dog which needs food is not gonna include food in his bundle because he knows it's gonna be required from main which already has food so webpack will do that for you and it's this gets pretty complex especially when you have libraries so let's say you have a jQuery scene, you have a, a jQuery plugin and stuff. So Webpack will figure out, okay, I know you don't need to include that in your bundle. So they optimize your bundle. So this can all, always, this can, you can either do that manually or you can let Webpack handle that for you. Compile time. So on the build process, actually, let me show you this. So if we, like I have this problem. So if I do, npm install so let me remove my target folder and let me you know let me do that so let me create food.js and cat needs food so my let's suppose my food is just like cat like food and okay and cat Sorry, yes, cat needs food, so cat needs food, so import food from food. Oh, no, that's food. I mean, cat. Sorry, it's getting confused. Okay, so we have food, only exports food, and then we have cat that imports food. Zoo is here, and do zoo also imports food. And we actually, I think we need to use it. No, I don't think we need to use it. We just need to import. Let's see if they're gonna re remove it if we don't use it. But then if I do npm run, mm, run build. So there is a, is a little report here. I know this is kind of hard to see. So Webpack gives you a little report. So main.bundle has 6.54k and one.bundle has 694. And the 
um, chunk names. We have a chunk called main and another chunk, the chunk number one. And those four modules have been included on the bundles. So we have cat, food, main, and zoo in that order. So now if we run it, You know what? There is a nice way to see the JavaScript. It's um, I just don't remember. There is a view I can see the. Is it that? No, snippets. I may not have it right now, but there is a view you can see the source files. There have been loaded. I think I didn't include the source maps. But anyway, I mean, we have this guy, we lazy load zoo, we have bundle, and we can inspect inside. So if we go to main.bundle, let's search for food. Yeah, food is here. So the food definition is here. But if you go to one.bundle, food is not here. I search for food, I don't, I just see the imported module food, so they turn, Webpack internally created those functions to import that, but it didn't include food on, on the bundle that's laser loaded, it's only on the first bundle. And um, actually the challenge that I'm going to give is about that, so you guys can play a little bit of that. But this is like the idea, so um, back to the code, I was able to, that, to do that just by using system.import and Webpack was smart enough to figure out that, okay, that's a bundle. Okay? All right. So, um, just to finish it off, I'm almost finishing. The, this slide, I wanted to have removed, but I forgot. <laughs> but uh, just to mention, there is another alternative to JSP, to the system called JSPN. I mean, it's interesting, but, uh, I think Webpack 2 does a little bit more. So JSPM is a package manager. It's kind of like NPM, but for the client side. It has system.js and it performs bundling. So it can do Webpack's work. But the way the JSPM resolves the module, it's dynamically, normally. You can also do pre-bundling, but the default behavior is to do that on the client side. So in order to do that on the client side, you need to load JSPM on the client side, load system JS on the client side, so it's, you have to load more stuff. With Webpack, you don't do that on the client side, you do it on, on the build time, so your bundles are smaller. Webpack 2 is almost getting released, it's still better, but the good things about it, it has native support for ES2015 and system.js, so you don't even have to download system.js, you just do system import and rejoice. Um, it loads modules, as we mentioned, it performs bundling and tree shaking. Tree shaking is something super cool. So if you have um, a very big module that has a lot of small uh, import, ex exports, so let's say you have a library that has 30 functions being exported, but you just need two of them. So if you do tree shaking, uh, web thing, gonna figure out, okay, you just need those two points. So let me remove the other 18 from your bundle, so I know you're not using them. So your bundle gets further off the money. So this is very, it's not, it's not only about the bundle, it's also about runtime. You're not gonna get full object and load entirely in your browser memory, and I'm gonna load those two points from the bundle, from the object to your uh, context. So it's a pretty cool thing that's coming up with that text too, yeah? So that's incredibly cracking. So, Webpack, so if you had the, li the library before, let's suppose you had the library before, and you didn't load that module, but then you have the mission, so you are already loading some module, and you are using that function, I believe that function, only that function is included in your bone, or on the late loaded bone. However, there is a however. This is meant to happen natively. 
because you're using Babel, right now I'm using Babel, Babel transformed that to CommonJS. And in CommonJS, you don't really have two shapes. This two shape is only when you are purely using S2. So if you do that in browser that really supports the S2, like Chrome, for instance, then you can get the real two shape. But if you're going to use Babel, no, you're not doing real two shape because it's still using the file at CommonJS and everything. So you're getting the entire object. So in that case, you get, have gotten the entire object before. So your lazy loaded bundle wouldn't have anything. And you would have loaded the entire library before. So it's a little tricky and not there yet, but it's a good idea. Okay. Um, I'm giving here some links. You can learn more about Webpack 2, the roadmap, and that project that I just mentioned about the zoo and the dog, it's right here. Okay. And now the challenge. If you guys are up for the challenge. So I'm gonna give you a few steps and I'm gonna even start together with you guys, okay? Um, this challenge is about we have some code base that everything is being loaded in one shop. And I want to invite you to lazy load two modules using system.js. Okay? So this is a project that I have. So probably it might be better for you to open the uh, go to meetup.com, find my the link from my talk and then click on the link. So this is my repo and this repo you can fork it on your GitHub account. If you don't want to fork it, you can just clone or download to your to your local host and play with it. But if you fork it then you have it saved on your account so you can push and keep it there. Um, First, you take a moment to understand implementation, and I'm even going to do that together. So there are two modules. Okay, so let's do it, actually. Let me do this step number two together. So we have this Webpack challenge. There are three files, main.js. So main.js, let me run it. So when you download the project, go to readme.md. You need to have node 4, at least. And then you're going to do npm install, npm run build, and HTTP server, just to serve. But basically, oh, that's the same one. Oh, that's the same one. Sorry. Okay, so you have this. In five seconds, something happens. So there is a, oh yeah, I didn't run. So let me follow the instructions. npm install. Then npm run build. That's going to generate a bundle. It's, it just generates one bundle called main.bundle. It has 193k, like pretty large. Because one of the files, animations, it requires like a third party library. So we have main.js, it, it has two modules animations and messaging. Animations, we need something called Merry Christmas. And messaging, we have something called alert. From animations, we import a library called Velocity, and that library is like 150k, it's a huge library. So we are getting that downloaded now, but because that, that module, we want to lazy load that, we would also be lazy loading this big mod dependency altogether. So like, this is a module that does some animation, and the other module messaging, it does some alert, so it, it pops up some message in the screen. I'm gonna show you guys right now. So this has finished loading, Oh, really? There is a bug. Cat? Oh, that was a. Um, it's it was trying to load my other bundle. Okay, that's gonna work. See, so two things happen. So let me refresh. So there is a timeout of five seconds. After five seconds, 
you see an alert. I'm learning how to lazy load. And if you click in the button Merry Christmas, it does some animation. You know? okay. Both things, we are we don't need both things on the page load, but here I'm not doing lazy loading, so I'm loading everything in one shot. So we have this main dot bundle, which has 189k. So the exercise is to lazy load the Merry Christmas module and the alert module. So the outcome is whenever we succeed, if you go to network and see JavaScript, instead of seeing main bundle with 189k, you would see main bundle with maybe 5k and lazy lo and, and the animation one's gonna be big but that's gonna come later so that's you can verify that by looking at the the network and seeing if the, the module gets lazy loaded okay I mean let me let me go back to the modules to explain you once again so this is the main we import the module, we import, import animations, we import Merry Christmas from animations, and we import alert from messaging. Here, we have a we have a button, right? But this is not lazy loading, so it's just checking. Oh, I don't have Merry Christmas, so okay, new Merry Christmas. So I'm consuming here the code that was imported in the top, and the other code is inside the set timeout of 5 seconds, 5,000 milliseconds. So after this code is ready, we do new alert, but uh, I'm also not lazy loading here, so this code is up here. So the exercise is for you to lazy load both things and see them live getting loaded on the map. And if you go back to readme, so I mean, you can do your changes and then probably you need to do this, npm run build, because your target folder has just one file. We want to see three files. We want to see main bundle, one dot bundle, and two dot bundle. And webpack is already configured. So there is a file called webpack config. You don't need to change that. The only thing you need to do is to use system.import to lazy load your modules, regenerate your bundles, and see them running live. Yeah? Okay. Okay. It, it didn't work? Oh, global. Okay. Yeah, I. One thing that I tried to do. Yeah. So in, I also had my global. I tried to include that as a dev dependency, but I didn't try that. I didn't really test that. So thank you very much. So npm install minus g http serve. Thank you. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bit of a problem. <laughs> and we have some sweets in the back. You want to have a little sugar refresher? I would want to have one.
And I forgot to stop recording. Of course.